Hello, everyone. Welcome to this Noble Proc webinar, Practical Process Automation. We will be talking about orchestrating microservices using BPMN. And BPMN stands for Business Process Modeling and Notation. It's part of our Noble Proc webinar series, A Cup of Tech. Note that it will be recorded. So grab your cup of tech with us today. And with our speaker, <clears throat> our trainer, and expert, BPM and expert, Philip van der Stichelen. He will share his knowledge and expertise with us during this presentation today. Hello, Philip. How are you doing? Hello, Natalia. I'm fine. Thank you. <laughs> Great. So you should be able to see my presentation now. Um, yes, perfect. Yes. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so, um, <laughs> thanks. So, yeah, my name is uh, Philippe van der Stichelen. I'm a consultant and trainer um, delivering trainings and consultancy for Noble Proc since almost 20 years now, I presume. Um, based in Brussels, uh, Belgium, Brussels. And, um, well, I work a lot in the, in the Netherlands and in France and in the UK on different middleware projects. Um, many projects concerning also involving microservices and analysis and, and business process modeling. So these are some of the uh, items we I'll go through today, um, like process automation and the integration puzzle, workflow engines, long running behavior, business processes, integration of business processes, um, business and IT collaboration, mm -hmm. the business drivers and the value of using tooling such as um, Bizagi or Camunda or Bistock, Microsoft or Oracle, so a suite. Typical middleware applications, but these days they tend to become more lightweight, like Camunda, I think is a nice example of a very lightweight engine that um, doesn't consume too many resources on your, on your machines. And again, as mentioned, if you have any questions, uh, just interrupt me immediately. You don't need to wait until the end. Um, so here they talk about process automation, which really is um, referring to a series of tasks, usually within an organization that needs to be performed to achieve value at the end, uh, desired result. As a developer, you may think of your tasks as a process. As an employee, you think of your job and the tasks involved as a process and as a business owner. I probably think of the full end-to-end -end view as the business owner of uh, Albert Hein. I will think of the handle sales as a process and I don't really care what happens inside. I have a very high level view of the, of the process. So BPMN will help you to model um, all of those different levels, always taking into account uh, who is the end user here, who is, who is the audience? And am I really delivering value to this audience? So many organizations are stuck with um, an existing architecture which may look quite complex and that they would like to improve, like the one on the left side. That's the integration puzzle. How can we improve on this? Because it's difficult to change, difficult to alter, very complex. And uh, you need to, to act quickly huh? if, if there's a, a new opportunity in the market space, or you want to innovate, or your competitors have new services and you can barely move or change anything to your existing architecture. Uh, this is because of historical reasons, huh? quick fixes and workarounds and new management that you need to switch from .NET to Java and the guys who made the, the applications and the connections have already left the organization and so on. So uh, companies really want to go to um, a setup like on the right side where you see clearly who does what. Um, responsibilities tasks assigned to specific responsibilities. You clearly see how they are connected. It's almost self-documenting and there's much more opportunities there for a reuse and streamlining and finding out uh, where are the bottlenecks. So <clears throat> our business process management tools become smarter and smarter. In the old days, uh, it was just maybe purely manual, huh? written on, on paper, how does a process work? How does it deliver value? And then in more, more recent years, huh? 20, 25 years, they, they become more and more sophisticated. 
they have built-in reporting capabilities. You can connect out of the box with web services, with REST services, um, integrated business rule engines, uh, task flows, and what have you. When we, um, when we talk about BPM, by the way, um, we refer to business process management. Hmm? Business process management, managing business processes. And that's a very broad umbrella. Hmm? Under that umbrella, you'll find uh, things uh, such as um, monitoring, hmm? definition, huh? modeling, modeling processes, monitoring them, monitoring processes, um, optimizing optimize processes uh, you'll find things such as um, optimize optimize if i can write it optimize processes execute processes making sure there is an audit trail and so on dot 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 and let's not forget to simply document document processes you need to be uh, compliant with certain regulations regulatory requirements regulatory requirements. So all of those uh, aspects fall under the BPM, well, BPM umbrella, uh, business process management. And when we talk about BPMN, then we refer specifically to the modeling side of things. Huh? Usually this modeling, you model the process by using uh, a visual uh, notation, visual language. That language is standardized, so we all understand the same things. So when we look at a BPMN diagram, where do we need to go on the internet if we want to figure out uh, what is the spec, the BPMN spec? Go to OMG, www.omg.org, and you'll find the specs over there. You go to specifications, and then you have something like popular standards, uh, popular OMG standards object management group, not, oh my God. And there you'll find BPM and BPM and spec, but also CORBA um, was used in the eighties and nineties, uh, common object request broker architecture. And then UML, of course, maybe you've used UML in your career at one point, unified modeling language or SysML and so on. Many open standards and BPM is one of them. So you can find those on the OMG website. So why BPM? Well, because of the reasons which I mentioned in my paint, huh? um, because you want to optimize, you want to document, you need to be compliant with regulatory requirements. Uh, you need an audit trail. You want to execute. You want to execute your processes. You want to orchestrate services. All of those are reasons why you would probably want to use uh, some aspects of BPM. BPM has always been used by organizations. It's even already mentioned in 1780 uh, in a certain way. Uh, so it's not new, obviously. Organizations have always been using BPM. What is new in more recent years uh, is the, the close link uh, between BPM and um, services. So what we see today is that um, our workflows which you model in BPMN can also be executed if you want to. You can execute the different steps inside of your workflow. Of course, the workflow um, here can just be uh, drawn on paper. Pen and paper will be difficult to, uh, to execute it, of course, if it's on paper. So preferably in some kind of tool, it doesn't matter, Visio could be used. Uh, Notepad, if you don't have a social life and you know XML, go ahead. You can write a BPMN file, bpmn.xml in Notepad. Will be a challenge, but it's, it is possible because that is what you need. You need a drawing and a tool that allows you to export the drawing as XML. And this XML file will then be, uh, can then be interpreted by some kind of software, uh, some kind of engine. Um, this was traditionally referred to as middleware, middleware application. Uh, middleware these days has a, a negative connotation to it, uh, ESBs also, uh, because they tended to become too smart, very smart. The pattern was usually um, smart pipes and um, smart pipes and dumb 
endpoints. Now, we don't want to make the same mistake with more modern tools. They tend to be very lightweight, not too smart actually, and the endpoints can be smart. So the services which you'll call applications or services, they should be smart. Um, and the tool should only interpret those steps, the what really, uh, the what you want to represent here, what needs to happen and stick to that. What needs to happen, not the how. So um, you should probably not put um, like Java code inside your process or C sharp code inside your process. If you can avoid it, put the Java code inside your services. It should reside over there. Um, and then call it, call it by some means, which is uh, preferably loosely coupled. Uh, uh, refrain from uh, building point-to-point -point connections, uh, even though sometimes that's your only option. Let's see if you can find another way of working. Point-to-point -point meaning uh, if something changes here, uh, you feel the impact over there and vice versa. We want it to be loosely coupled. Usually that means using something like HTTP, uh, JSON, could still be XML files, of course, SOAP, REST interactions, um, obviously these days. Um, it's more and more REST uh, and SOAP is uh, sort of disappearing. But here you see the link between BPM and uh, a service-oriented architecture or a microservice uh, architecture because they help us to connect to logic in a very loosely coupled way. So this is where we find uh, BPM, BPM approach, and then the link to um, a technology and architecture which allows us to link to the services in a loosely coupled way, which would be microservice best practices and SOA best practices, of course. Um, that's why BPM has this tight link with service oriented and microservice architecture. Bear in mind that your workflow should only coordinate. Hmm? So when, you, when you're drawing your BPM and diagrams, always try to have this mindset of um, what needs to happen, huh? what, not how. It's a very important mindset. So it's very different from the classic approach. In the old days, classic approach, the work was done within the workflow. A modern approach is more like, um, what needs to happen? Well, I want to calculate VAT. Um, how does it need to happen? I don't care. If I'm a business analyst and I'm drawing my BPM and flows, I only care about what needs to happen. So calc VAT. How should it be implemented? Well, let uh, developers maybe decide. Of course, based on specs, uh, specs that they receive from the business analysts. Um, but the logic, uh, the real logic, the, the work should be done over there. This is where the work is done. That's where VAT is calculated and then the result comes back. See, In this way, you get a very nice um, distinction or segregation between something which is very stable or could potentially be very stable and something which changes uh, every few years because this is about technology choices and this is just a business view. What needs to happen? Oh, I want to board a passenger on a plane with KLM. Well take the drawing from 50 years ago and the one from 2021. And I bet there's not that many differences. What has changed, of course, is the technology and the underlying technology. So BPMN, some uh, basic shapes here, activities, gateways, events, and data. That is usually how we build a BPMN diagram with those basic shapes. So one could argue BPMN is very simple. It is. Uh, the basics are simple. You indeed only have like events, the circles and uh, tasks, I should say maybe activities, but atomic activities are referred to as tasks. Atomic activity doesn't contain anything. You cannot split it up into smaller chunks. So it's also referred to as a task. Of course, sometimes uh, you can put stuff inside a container, it's really like referring to a new diagram. And then we say it's a sub-process. It's 
it's an activity which is a compound activity. It's an activity that contains other activities. So then it's a sub process. But if you cannot split it up into smaller chunks, um, then it's considered a task. What else do we have? We have gateways. This would be a gateway where you can uh, make a decision. And this one, another gateway. But that's more like a merge gateway. It's just merging two sequence flows before we continue with a single sequence flow. It's, it makes the diagram prettier. But in this specific case, because of this being an exclusive gateway, you could get away with doing this. There's no issue because BPMN uses tokens, and there would only be one token generated. Is your claim higher than 1,000? Yes or no? That's it. It cannot be yes and no at the same time. So there will be a token here, going there, going there, and only triggering this task once before it reaches the end. So there's no ambiguity here. We could do away with the gateway here. Sometimes you want gateways to be there, especially if you have parallel tasks. In that case, you want to wait until you have a token on each of the incoming sequence flows. And then you continue with a single token to inform client. You don't want to inform the customer twice or three times uh, just because the three tokens are arriving at this uh, gateway. Right? You want to merge them first. All the work is done and you continue informing the client. And then the audience. Um, don't try to put all your knowledge or insight into the process in a single diagram. It will never work. Some of the audiences will be uh, not happy at all, like the CEO will not be happy if you show him a diagram with lots of details. He doesn't care. He just wants to see that there is indeed handle sale and handle payment in Albert Hans organization. And that's, that's all. And then the developer will not be happy if you only tell a developer, well, at Albert Hans we sell articles and that's it and we have payments. Developers will need a more detailed view of exactly what's going on there. Otherwise, I cannot develop it. See, It's impossible to have a single diagram that appeals to all the audiences. So make sure that you use levels, level 0, level 1, level 2. Each level can add a different subset of the capabilities of BPM. I mentioned BPM is simple, which is true. The basics are simple. But then, as you start adding different icons inside the gateways, a circle, a plus sign, an X, a star, a pentagon, or different icons in your tasks, like a user task, or a little hand, a manual task, or a cogwheel service task, and so on. In your events, same thing. Turn this into a timer all of a sudden. If you total all them, all those elements, if you make the total of all those elements in the end, you get more than 100 elements. Uh, unlikely to be understood by all your audiences. See, that's the problem. The solution is simple. Don't use that complexity on all the levels. Huh? If it's for a CEO, make sure it's high level. If it's for a developer, your diagram, then add more details. Huh? You decide how many levels you want to use and what kind of detail you use on every, on every level. Your BPM diagrams can be executed. Hmm? Then you need some kind of workflow engine. The workflow engine will glue, in fact, your diagram with uh, underlying applications, ideally exposed as services. But that's not, that's not always the case. Sometimes you need to talk to legacy, and then you'll need a specific legacy adapter. Um, the workflow engine can work in two ways. Uh, roughly speaking, it can push work to the services, like invoking an API, a REST API. Or uh, the workflow engine could put uh, work in like a task list hmm? and then services could just pull the work from the task list as they are available. Hmm? That's very uh, loosely coupled also. Hmm? The workflow, and workflow engine just worries about executing the tasks and checking that at some point uh, a result comes back and the services uh, can pull the work from the, from the queue as soon as they are ready. Um, so highly decoupled. Hmm? Very nice pattern, huh? the, the pull pattern. Uh, Camunda works like this, and a few other engines also work like that, of course. Uh, here we have, again, uh, a very short huh, BPMN uh, process. Payment required, charge credit card, and receive payments. So what happens here is that it needs to be triggered. So we use the workflow engine hmm, 
to trigger the process, we create a process instance, which is added to a database table. And then in order to do something here, in order to really charge a credit card, you do need, of course, some kind of glue code, or you need to use an adapter, a connector, HTTP connector, SMTP connector to talk to email, uh, invoke a REST API and so on. But something needs to happen, of course, and you need to glue the drawing with the physical world, which is, uh, of course, done by the, the engine, uh, the workflow engine. Um, also, just for quality reasons, make sure that your analysts uh, use domain-driven design when they think about services, uh, they will be more modular, uh, e higher quality services. So there's a very interesting book here by Eric Evans, 2003. Make sure it's on your bookshelf because it will be more and more important in the future when you move to microservices. Uh, they are highly autonomous, uh, standalone. Uh, so they need to know what data elements they need to work. And this will help you. It will help you to derive a bounded context. In this case, for example, for an order service, uh, easy to eat is like a delivery room. You want to be delivered food at home. If you analyze what clients need, uh, customers want to uh, order food uh, from a menu and the order contains order items. So by using a tool such as uh, Enterprise Architect, this one, which you may be familiar with, you can start uh, analyzing uh, your different bounded contexts. Uh, what happens in ordering? What happens in payments? What happens inside a restaurant? Uh, what data does a restaurant need? And later on, this will become the data also needed inside your microservices. So it's a very interesting approach and, and important as you start orchestrating microservices. Um, we want high quality microservices. So here I have um, an example of a bounded context ordering, delivery and restaurant. So those could become microservices later on and we can now choose to orchestrate them. We could ask orchestrate them from a central point, which means I would have uh, another service here, which becomes the orchestrator. So that is one of the possible patterns, of course, use orchestration. It's a central orchestrator that says, uh, now I need ordering, and now I need a restaurant, and now I need delivery. There is another way of working. An orchestrator does uh, create dependencies between uh, the orchestrator and the services, of course. Um, there's another way of working. It's referred to as uh, choreography. You could compare choreography like this. Individual dancers, very autonomous. They do react upon the what the other one is doing, of course. But orchestration is like this. You have the central orchestrator and he's telling other people what to do. That's the difference between orchestration and choreography. This is more agile. It's more uh, dynamic because you can add new dancers to the mix and they will just react to the signals that they receive from the other dancers. So that's the beauty of using a choreography. And um, I made a, a small choreography here in, uh, in Camunda where we have the customer who wants to order food and we have a restaurant and we have a courier, see? So I'm mapping this to my slide. I have an ordering bounded context. I have a restaurant and I have a delivery. And they could potentially become my individual microservices later on. And now we need to analyze um, what events could be published by ordering and who would be interested in those events? And what events are, is restaurant consuming? And what events could it publish? And the same for delivery boys, huh? delivery or couriers, what will they consume as events and what will they publish as events? This is what I'm trying to show here in, in the Camunda environment, which allows you to not only model um, your workflows, but also execute them. So what's going on here, very simply put, is a customer, uh, we could turn this into a service later on, a microservice, uh, choose a meal from the menu, payment needs to be authorized, and then we send a signal, order completed. The signal uh, which I'm sending here is order complete. See, who is subscribing to the signal? Restaurant. Restaurant waits for order complete and then prepares food. In turn, sends a signal, food is ready. Who is interested, interested in food is ready? Couriers, see? The courier has a receive signal, food ready. 
delivers the food and then sends the signal food delivered. And now I could add, of course, uh, listeners to that signal. I think the restaurant is interested also in, oh, the food is delivered. Mm. And also the customers. Mm. It happens uh, that uh, you get a signal on your phone, uh, your food is delivered. Well, no, it's not. Something went wrong and you need to go to um, maybe call a restaurant or um, a delivery room mm, to complain. So um, I'm going to deploy this for the quick demo here. Deploy, give it a deployment name. It is deployed. I'm using Camunda cockpit to lick, to, to not to lick, but <laughs> to look at my instances. Um, and I have a, also a task list application here, which is currently empty, which I can use to start my process. So I'm going to start my process and I'm going to start my customer, customer process, start. And there's a new task, choose meal from menu. So what's happening now is that this process is going to be instantiated. See, I have my customer process, a running instance, and I'm here. See, you can follow what's going on. Choose meal from menu. Let's choose a meal from menu. I'm not really going to choose anything. I'm just going to claim this task and complete it so that you can move on to the next step. See, prepare food. So what happened? I went through payments and then I send the signal, order complete. And that means that I now have restaurant here, which is activated based on the signal. They prepare the food. Let's prepare food. Claim this complete. Done. Look back at my processes. I have uh, my restaurant process, which is finished. And now the courier process, which started up. See, it received a signal from the restaurant. I need to deliver food. Let's deliver the food. Claim this, complete it. Any tasks left? Review of the restaurant. So what has happened? This one has completed. Send a signal back to the, uh, the customer. And uh, see, that's the only instance left running there. Customer needs to review the restaurant. So that's the very last step. Let's review the restaurant, claim this and complete. All my processes have completed. I'm finished here. And the beauty of this mechanism is that at any point in time, you can add new participants to the mix. So we have ordering, restaurant and delivery. Imagine uh, you only have a single delivery board right now, um, but things are heating up. You have a lot of, uh, a lot of requests for, for food. So um, we need more delivery boys. Easy, just add more couriers to the mix. They will just listen, they will just subscribe to the same signal, of course. To the signal, food is ready and consume it. Another delivery boy, another one, another one. It's extremely scalable working with um, events uh, using signals in BPMN and calling into, into, micro, into microservices. Uh, we could even set courier to um, multiple instances. Uh, if I go to the, to the pool, I can set it to multiple instances so that I would generate as many couriers as needed based on, uh, on the work going on. Um, that is a very quick <laughs> overview of, uh, of BPMN, a few of the symbols and a modern way of working by using uh, events and microservices. Um, this concludes my presentation for today. Um, so feel free to, to ask any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Philippe. That was very interactive, <laughs> interesting <laughs> session. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? Please send us the questions via the chat and Philip uh, will try his hmm. best to answer. Maybe you would like to know more details about Camunda or anything. Let's see if we... Oh, okay. Um, I think we have the first question now. Mm -hmm. Could you allude a bit on the differences between Camunda and Zeeb? 
<laughs> CB. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's already a very difficult one, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, as I'm not, um, I'm not a tool specialist, so I know a lot about BPM and I know a lot about microservices and architectures and best practices, and I do know a little bit about um, Bizagi and uh, Bistock and Oracle SOA Suite and Tipco and web methods and all those tools, but I don't know the exact differences between Kamuna and ZB, unfortunately. So I, I'll have to uh, park that one, but I'll, uh, I can answer that one later on if you want to. I do, uh, yes. <laughs> so sorry yeah. about that one. <laughs> I, Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Um, so it was a question from mm -hmm. yeah, Gerald. From Gerald. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Gerald. Gerald. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you, Gerald. If you have uh, like mm -hmm. more um, questions about it, and maybe you would like mm -hmm. to go in depth, then you can send your questions later on after yeah. after the webinar. They can roughly do the same thing, and they look the same. So I really need to find out what is the real difference between them. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Because Philip then will have an opportunity. Um, to go into it and uh, yeah. and answer it um, Indeed. in more detail. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see. Oh, we've got another question here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it's it's a kind of a generic one. Is the complexity worth going for microservices? Are there any expecting expected benefits? Um, yeah, so um, indeed. So as you can see, there is some complexity involved in using microservices. And sometimes the question is, uh, is it worth the complexity? What is the added value? So the added value is indeed uh, agility. As I mentioned before, um, it's quite easy here uh, to add new listeners to the mix. It's not messages being used and point-to-point -point communications, but it does come, uh, especially choreography at a cost. Hmm? because it's more difficult to figure out what's going on here, because we don't really have links like here, uh, messages going back and forth for your payment authorization system. I added it just as an example. You can see a message goes, a message comes back. Uh, and for signals, you don't see. Signals are like radio signals. Um, you don't see them. So you need to really document what's going on. And the underlying complexity shouldn't be uh, underestimated, especially if you want to start correlating signals, because signals are always broadcast. But sometimes the requirement is that you send a signal and you do want it to be captured by a single specific instance. And then you need correlation. And um, that goes against the, the pattern of signals, really. Signals are always broadcast. But it can be achieved, but it has a certain complexity. It's also quite difficult to, uh, to implement uh, transactions, so like distributed transactions are difficult to implement, um, especially the idea of rollbacks. So you'll need to resort to, to sagas, use sagas, which I did prepare a slide on, on saga, I think here, <laughs> this is a saga, uh, but I was running out of time. Uh, so the saga is the idea that uh, you have distributed transactions. So reserve car, book hotel and book flight, and they could fail. If one of them fails, um, I'm not going to Ibiza if I don't have a hotel, see? I'm, I'm stuck with my car and my flight, so I want to roll back everything. So I need to individually uh, cancel my flights, cancel the hotel, and cancel the car. So that would be each microservice individually rolling back or compensating what, what has happened. So it comes at, co at the cost of complexity, and you gain agility. It may not be always necessary to have that complexity and have that those fancy features, of course. Um, any other questions? Mm, okay, thank you so much. Maybe yes, obviously, from, there is uh, always trade-off <laughs> <laughs> between complexity and, uh, um, yes. and the benefits. One, yeah, there is Patrick, another question. Right? Can you read it? Yeah. Where do we draw the line in adding the how in here? And what is the philosophy behind not putting it not in here? Uh, yeah, the line in adding the how in here, and what's the philosophy behind not putting it not in here? Uh, <laughs> wait, let me copy this just a moment and go to pain so I maybe can draw my, my thoughts. <clears throat> Where do you draw the, the line in adding the how? Uh, Maybe the question is uh, the difference between the what and the how, if I understand it correctly.
Do you refer to a specific slide, Patrick? Um, for for this one, it's just as soon as you touch upon IT choices and technology, it becomes a how when you when you start uh, thinking in terms of solutions. As a business analyst, you try to stick to the what, so don't try to link to solutions. But it's difficult, hmm? certainly because some analysts know the solution and they go too quickly maybe to the solution. As in why we are only making the what and not the how in the BPMN. Ah, okay. Yeah, all right. Why don't we put the, it's a good question, of course. Huh? Why don't we put the, the how in the diagram? Well, the answer is that if you put how in the diagram, you're putting the how of 2020, 2021 in the diagram. Hmm? Today's technology. Um, it will not be um, extremely reusable. Hmm? What about next year, the year after? Uh, if technology changes, you would also have to uh, change your, your diagram then. Uh, another problem of putting logic inside BPMN or execution logic or scripts uh, or Java is that it's not reusable, of course. You need to go through all the steps that become bef that are mentioned before that step before you can use it. So that's another reason for putting the, the how over there and then expose it as a, as a service so that everyone can reuse it like this. It's really uh, the effort of making your diagram as future-proof as possible. I want it to be, ideally, if someone in 100 years, in 100 years, reads my diagram, I would like to uh, make sure that that's, that person can still understand what I drew 100 years ago. I'm exaggerating a little bit, of course. But in the end, that is the mindset. I want my diagrams to be as future proof as possible, especially, of course, the diagrams uh, on the higher levels, the uh, level zero and level one, and level two and level three, and so on. Level one, level two, even can be very much about what. And then as you go to level three, as it needs to become executable, you may switch to more technical aspects. But that's one of the reasons. Make sure you have something stable that doesn't change every two minutes because technology changes. <clears throat> um, any other questions? Uh, I think we have time for one more question mm -hmm. now. <clears throat> oh, there is another one from mm -hmm. Jim. Um, Preferred Kamunda setup options. Thank you, mm -hmm. Jim. Okay. Um, well, preferred setup options, not really. Um, Kamunda itself says uh, you can choose, but there are a few uh, options, of course. There are a few ways in which you can set up uh, Kamunda. Um, let's see if I have a few options in the slides here. Maybe around the end, yeah. These are some of the options. You can embed Kamunda within like even a microservice because it's so lightweight, it can run inside a microservice and that becomes then like an orchestration microservice. That's one of the options. It can run shared, hmm? container managed. Uh, you have a runtime container, multiple Java applications talking to the process engine, which is uh, shared. You can run it like this, hmm? a standalone process engine and then multiple remote applications hmm? connecting to it. Um, you, can, you can cluster it. Hmm? have uh, the Kamunda engines um, and the applications uh, run and talk to a shared database. So you, they can be clusters uh, for high availability and fault tolerance. It can run, of course, as an image. So easy. Just type Docker, the Kamunda image, and off you go. Uh, Localhost 8080, and it, it just works. Um, very easy to achieve this one also as a Docker image. There are quite a few options. It's difficult to say you need to use this one or that one. Um, all of them are very valid. It's really, uh, it's, it really depends on your context. So that's also a very difficult question uh, to answer, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much, Philip. And um, yes, again, it was a very informative session. Mm -hmm. um, 
Thank you everybody who joined us today. And uh, I think we are going to finish now. Mm -hmm. um, there will be a recording later sent to you, a recording of this event. If you have any other questions regarding this topic, you can send them to me and we will answer maybe mm -hmm. uh, or email. Um, yeah, so thanks again. And um, please follow us on LinkedIn and hopefully right. we will connect again during our future events. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Have a good afternoon. Have a good bye -bye. afternoon indeed. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.